All right, so let's get into it. I'm using the New King James Version of the Bible, so if I'm reading it, it sounds a little different than if you're using NIV or NLT, that's why. This is the New King James Version. This is what most Calvary chapels use. And Acts chapter 2 is filled with so, there's so much meat in Acts chapter 2. Originally, I was going to do all of Acts chapter 2. I was going to do a chapter each Bible study. And then when I'm getting into the study, I'm like, man, there's no way that I could do all this in one in one lesson and give each verse the time that it deserves. So this one, I'm, I'm probably going to break it up into two, if not, definitely two, maybe three, Acts chapter two. And there might be a couple other chapters throughout Acts that I'm going to have to split up, but this one for sure. And it's worth it. This is an incredible chapter. Like I was saying before I restarted the live, I don't like saying that I, that, that there's a favorite chapter of mine or a favorite book of the Bible because they're all so good. But man, Acts chapter two is definitely one of my favorites. It is so filled. I have so many notes here to go over. Like, like this is 13 verses and it's packed filled. So if you can, I would recommend taking notes. If you rather, or like, if you'd rather just watch, um, then that's fine. You can rewatch it on my YouTube channel and take notes. But any time that you, like really any sermon, I go to Calvary Chapel. So we, so they, they preach straight from the ver or, or straight from the word verse by verse. It's called expository teaching. Scripture interpreted by scripture. So anytime that I'm at a service, I'm going crazy on the notes. I'm like, like my fingers are always moving. But when I'm able to like do a study on my own and I'm not in a church setting, right? With the pastor like speaking up on, you know, on, on stage or the pulpit, uh, I can pause and I can like write it out into my own words and like take my time with it. And that's what I did today um, when I was doing this study for Acts chapter two. So uh, I would strongly suggest taking notes though, guys, at any point. If you're watching one of my videos, if you're at church, because let's say a few months from then you're uh, in the word in Acts chapter two and you want to refer back to your notes without having to watch a whole sermon. You got them right there. I always do it in my phone. I used to handwrite them, but now I do it in my phone because now I always have access to them. So um, so that's what I would say to you. Please take notes. All right. So let's get into it. Acts chapter two. Um, before I start, just as like a quick little recap of Acts chapter one, if you didn't watch the last study, Acts chapter one was addressed to Theophilus. Okay. Now there was a, there's a few different ways of thinking here on who specifically Theophilus was, but in general, the one that I, for lack of a better term, the one that I like the most and the one that I think applies just overall in a big picture setting is that it means like the word itself is Greek and it means lover of God. So all of the book of Acts, which is like a continuation of the gospel of Luke, because Luke is the one who wrote the gospel of Luke. And then Luke is also the one who wrote the Acts. It's Acts or the Acts of the Apostles is what it has, at least in my, you know, my Bible. But really, it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. <laughs> um, so again, so this, this whole book is written to the true church, okay? The true church over the course of time. Anybody who is a lover of God, this is too. Um, and it's to be read and understood by every generation until the return of Christ. That's what Acts is in general, Okay. And um, like I said, the book of Acts is a continuation of the gospel of Luke, which chronicles the work of the Holy Spirit. And Acts chapter two, <laughs> love this chapter. It's basically like the birthday of the church. This is when the Holy Spirit comes on the scene and this is when everything starts. It's so exciting. And today we're only going to go through the first 13 verses. Um, I encourage you to read the whole chapter, you know, after we're done. But uh, let's go ahead and get into it, all right? I'm going to, typically I'm going to read like a verse or two, sometimes a group of verses, and then I'll stop and I'll have some things to say. Um, so, uh, oh, and also if anybody has any questions or anything, I'm really not going to be paying attention to, to this because I'm going to be focused on the word and like the notes that I have to share with you. So um, after we're done, I'll leave it open for any questions and for prayer. Um, but, uh, but yeah, just a heads up. Like if you're asking a question, I'm probably not going to see it. If I happen to see it and... I can answer it quickly than I will, but most of the time I'm, I'm really not able to. All right, Acts chapter two. Again, this is New King James Version. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. One more time, I'm gonna read that because there's a lot that I wanna say about just this, just this one verse. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. All right, so Pentecost is the second major Jewish feast of the year, all right? There was three a year, where wherever they lived, wherever Jewish people lived, a lot of them were in Jerusalem, but they would make the journey to Jerusalem. There was three a year, and this was the second one. And um, this is usually 
like probably like the most attended one of all of them because of the time of the year that it is. It's in the springtime, right? Very nice out. Like yesterday, today it's a little weird in Vegas. It went from like 75 degrees yesterday, gorgeous. Now it's like 40 something windy. The weather in Vegas is nuts. <laughs> it really is crazy. But typically on a nice spring day, the day of Pentecost, um, or excuse me, the feast of Pentecost was like the probably the most attended of all the feasts. Um, and it took place exactly 50 days after the Passover. All right. So Pentecost means 50th. Like, like that's what that word means. So this took place 50 days after the Passover. And if you remember when Jesus was crucified, it was during the Passover week. And then after being resurrected, he was on earth for about 40 days or so. And, or excuse me, he was on earth for, for, for 40 days. So this takes place, this what we're reading in Acts chapter 2 takes place about 10 days or so after Jesus ascended back to heaven. 10 days, less than two weeks. This is when this is happening, all right? Um, and the purpose, by the way, of the Pentecost feast was to celebrate the harvest of their winter grains, all right, and what they would do is they would give their first and their best to God. They would say, "This is, you know, this is yours here." So we're, we're offering it back to you. It's a form of worship, and it's the same kind of idea that we have today with tithes and offerings, right? You hear giving ten percent, giving your first fruits, like whenever you're, like whenever you get paid or whenever you get any sort of money, as a form of worship, we are to tithe. We are to give ten percent. Now, look, it's very important to note that. <laughs> Everything we have isn't even ours. We came to this earth with nothing and we're going to leave with nothing. Nothing that we have is ours. It's all God's anyway. People in the world, people who don't have a relationship, they're like, no, that's mine. I earned it. This is mine. This is all because I worked hard, blah, 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 blah. Me, 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 me. No, everything is God's. Again, we didn't come to this earth with nothing. We're not leaving this earth with nothing. Jeff Bezos with all his billions can't buy another second of time with all his billions. He can't take one of his cars with him or a nice suit or a Rolex. None of us can take anything with us when we're gone. It's all God's, all of it, okay? And everything that we have or will have belongs to God. So it's important to note and to realize that when we tithe, we're not giving God something that's ours. We're giving him what's already his. It's already his. We're just returning a portion of it to him and say, here, Lord, this is a form of worship. This is for you anyway, okay? And he's so gracious and so awesome that he lets us keep 90% of it. He lets us keep 90% of it. And I also want to say that um, when you tithe, okay? Now, I, I have people that actually tithe to me, which seems weird because I don't look at myself as a pastor. I don't have a church, but they send me some, I mean, it's the Lord, sending it to me through other people, but they're like, this is my monthly tithe. Like, you know, your videos help me so much. Your, your Bible studies bless me so much. And they tithe to me. So if you feel led to tithe to a, a, a person, their ministry, right? Because it's not my ministry. It's the Lord's ministry through me. I'm just being obedient and doing what he has led me to do and using the gifts and the talents that he's given me to share the gospel, to reach the lost, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. So if you're tithing or you're donating to any person, a ministry or a church, it's important to realize it's not yours anyway. It's the Lord's. And as an act of worship, you're giving it back to the Lord. Okay? It's very important to note that because so many people, like, I'm not going to say the person's name, but so many people, someone in my family used to feel like, oh, I got to tithe. I can't, I, I can't even afford this right now. We can't even pay bills. I can't tithe. It's not yours anyway. And I know I used to think like that as well. So I'm not saying that I'm like uh, above this at all. It's very easy to think, well, man, I can't afford this. This isn't even mine. How am I going to pay these bills? I, I can't make it as it is. How am I going to give 10% when I can't even pay my bills? It's the Lord's act of worship. You show him. This is like, Lord, I trust you here. This is yours anyway. Here, I trust you. This is a form of worship. So anyway, and then in the next part of verse one, um, when it says that they were all in one accord in one place. All right. Now they were truly in one accord. They were truly all together in the place that Jesus instructed them all to be in all along. Now, if you were here for the Bible study I did last week, Peter and the other disciples got or they they tried to get ahead of God when they uh, elected Matthias as the 12th disciple. Since since Judas did what he did and now Judas is dead, they felt like they needed to elect a 12th disciple. That was not appointed by God. That was them trying to go ahead of God and trying to do things on their own. Right. 
Now, it wasn't Matthias's fault, like I mentioned, but God had already chosen his 12th disciple, and that was Paul. We don't learn about him, or he doesn't come on the scene until Acts chapter 9, which is another one of my favorite chapters. Ooh, I can't wait to go to Acts chapter 9, but focus, Corey, focus. So, so anyway, here though, in Acts chapter 2, they're all in one accord, all right? Okay, someone just said sin isn't real. Stop. All right, we're just gonna we're just gonna mute this person. Sin isn't real. Do you, do you even know what sin means? Sin means missing the mark. That's what sin literally means. Missing the mark. The mark of what? The mark of perfection. Because that's what it takes for us to enter into the heaven, a perfect place for eternity. It takes perfection. Pro tip: nobody's perfect. Only Jesus is. So when you put your faith in Jesus and truly believe in him with all your heart, now his perfection, his righteousness is imputed, is given to us. So now we're perfect in God's eyes. It's just as if our sins never happened. It's just as if every time that we missed the mark, that never happened. God forgets them, literally as far as east is from the west. And you know what's really cool about that? East from the west there's a North Pole and a South Pole. So we know essentially where the North ends or begins and the South ends or begins. East and West, it's forever. They're just, one's this way, one's that way, they're gone. As far as East is from the West, God forgets it. He doesn't just like forgive, he literally chooses to forget. Now, how can you be like, well, we can't just choose to forget. Well, you're thinking about that from a human perspective. We're talking about God here. He can do whatever he wants, <laughs> whatever he wants. He forgets them, literally gone. That's why Jesus is needed in every single human being's life because all of us miss the mark. Every single one of us has said a lie or has stolen something or has uh, had a crazy thought or has um, acted out of rage or hit somebody or whatever. There's thousands of different sins that I could, well, maybe I can't name thousands, but there's a lot of sins, a lot of ways that we miss the mark of perfection. <laughs> so we need a savior. Sin is very, very real. And you know what the wages of sin are? You know what we get paid in for our sins? Death. That's what we get paid in is death. And you know why? Jesus resurrected from the dead. Well, first off, he is God. Nothing can hold him back. But Jesus never sinned. Jesus was perfect. So once he died, it was like death was like, all right, I got no beef with you. <laughs> like, what are you doing in the grave? Get out of here, right? That's, that's essentially what was happening. Jesus never sinned. So he's not getting paid with death because he never sinned. He was perfect. And all who believe in him, everyone who calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. And his perfection is given to us. So here, the rest of uh, verse one, they were all truly in one accord, all right? They were in the place that the Lord had commanded them to be, right? He said, wait for me. But they weren't really waiting in, in Acts chapter one. They were trying to do things without waiting for the Lord, all right? And um, it's also important to note that the perfect place to be able to receive something awesome that God is about to do is that place that when you're waiting for the Lord, when it's in his timing, not our own. Oftentimes we try to make our will fit into God's will, but no, it should always be his will, not our own. Oftentimes we pray for our will to be done, not his will. And if you didn't know, anytime that you say in Jesus name, what that means is that you're praying for his will to be done. So if you've been praying for something, whatever it might be, a new car, a new job, like whatever you've been praying for, and you're like, God doesn't hear me. He doesn't answer my prayers. Well, are you praying for your will to be done? Are you praying for what you think is best for your life? Or are you praying for his will to be done? Because that's how we should be praying. That's how he answers our prayers is whenever we're praying in his will, when our will, excuse me, when his will aligns with our life, that's what we should be praying for. That's what it means to pray in Jesus name. Um, so I want you to think about something. How many times and you know, it might be a hard thought to think about how many times in your life overall, but just think about how many times in our life collectively as human beings that we have hindered God to doing something amazing, right? God wants to do something amazing in our life, but we hinder him because we were not in a place to receive it. Think about that. And what kind of place or like, like what kind of things are what hold us back from being in a place to receive it? Well, lack of patience, 
like Peter in Acts chapter one, <laughs> all right? He, he had no patience. He's like, okay, well, we got to do this. Let's do all the hard work for the Lord. Now we got to decide, uh, you know, who the 12th disciple is. Let, let's cast lots. Okay, who has this experience? Okay, Matthias, you're the one, right? And then he, <laughs> in Acts chapter one, and then he's like, essentially, Lord, we did all the hard work for you. Now will you bless this? And God's like, I didn't choose Matthias. You chose Matthias. So God wasn't going to do something amazing in Matthias, which by the way, that was the last time that we ever heard about Matthias in Acts chapter one. He was nowhere mentioned in the Bible. Again, that's how we know that he was not chosen by God. He was chosen by man. Um, so lack of patience, um, lack of obedience. We're not being obedient in the small things. Why would God bless us with something bigger, something amazing, if we're not even being obedient with the small things? Okay, so that's another thing that can cause us to hinder God doing something amazing in our life. A few other things, fear, anxiety, walking in the flesh, satisfying the desires of the flesh, not denying yourself like Jesus says, Matthew 16, 24. That's the verse that changed everything for me. If anyone wants to come after me, or if anyone desires to come after me, which side note, that's what it is to be a Christian, to be a follower of Christ. That's what it literally means, to be a follower of Christ. If anyone desires to come after me, they must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Deny themselves. And in the Gospel of Luke, since I guess, you know, I, I probably should have referenced Luke 9, 23. If anyone wishes, or if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Daily we are to die to our flesh. But so many of us as humans <laughs> walk in the, like walk in the flesh rather than the spirit. And when you do that, you hinder what God wants to do in your life. You hinder something amazing that the Lord wants to do in your life. Um, and something else is not being in unity with the true church. As we see here, they were all in one accord. They were completely unified. So when you have churches that believe this or other churches that believe that, and there's division among the body of Christ, or when you have churches that support things that directly go against the Bible directly, like somebody was just asking that question. I'm not even going to say it because TikTok gets weird about it. I could get banned if I mention it. So you know what I'm talking about, but there's things that are accepted within the body of Christ, the body, I'll say it like that, that directly go against scripture. It's not okay. We're not in unity. That church is not in unity. So God can't do anything amazing in there because those people, those leaders of the church are hindering God by this, by this lack of obedience, by going against what the word says, by Choosing to seek the congreg or like to, to like uh, be seeker friendly and worried about the congregation and the people coming back and probably the tithes and offerings. They don't want to offend anybody. So they're not going to talk about the hard parts of the Bible. They're just only going to talk about the good parts. They're only going to say that uh, Jesus loves you and Jesus will forgive you and you can name it and claim it and you can, you'll never get sick again. You'll never have to worry about money again. Blah, 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 blah. Lies. Lies, of course, that is true. God can do those things. But when they're saying that this is what it is to be a Christian and that if you just put your faith in Jesus, you're never going to have to worry about insert thing there. That's a false gospel. And like Paul says, that's no gospel at all. That's a prosperity gospel. That's a name it and claim it. That's a tickle me Elmo version of a sermon. You won't ever hear anybody at some sort of church like that talk about denying yourself. Talk about repentance of your sins. All you hear is Jesus loves you and Jesus will forgive you. So what does that do to them? They walk into that building and they leave the exact same way that they came in. They just feel better. They have this like motivational time. Woo, okay, I'm good to go. I can keep living in my sin because Jesus loves me and he'll forgive me. No, because then you're taking what Christ did on the cross in vain. And that's dangerous. That's very, very dangerous. All right, kind of got off on a little tangent there. Um, last thing I want to say here about, uh, verse one, told you there was a lot, like we're what 15 minutes in, I'm only one verse in. This is why there's no way I could have did Acts chapter two in one, in one video. Um, so there's four things to point out that we see going on among the disciples right here, um, that would do well to mimic in our lives to safeguard ourselves from hindering God. Okay. There's four things. First prayer. Okay. As we see prayer a.k.a. seeking the Lord always. That's number one. Number two, assembly, gathering together, okay? You hear people say, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. Okay, that might be true. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian, but you are severely prohibiting something amazing that the Lord wants to do in your life because you're forsaking the gathering. You're forsaking the assembly. 
And in Hebrews 10, 25, it says that we are not to forsake the assembling of the body. So if you're not to forsake that, and you're like, I don't want to go to church. It's, a bunch, it's filled with a bunch of hypocrites. I'm not going to that church. I believe in Jesus, but I'm not going to the church. A bunch of hypocrites there. That's basically like you saying, I'm not going to go to the gym because there's a lot of jiggly people in there. There's a lot of out of shape people at the gym. I'm not going to go there. People should be in shape at the gym. Everybody should be toned up and have muscles and, and like run miles every single day at the gym. I'm not going to go there because there's a bunch of hypocrites at the gym. It's the same exact thing. Except when you apply that to the church, you're saying you're not going to go and you're going to forsake the gathering of the assembly because there's hypocrites there. Well, first off, Christianity has nothing to do with people who claim to be Christians. Christianity has 100% to do with Christ and who he is. Hey, hey, well, thank you, men, men's room, Louis, for saying I'm terrible. I appreciate that. God bless you. Somebody obviously in the faith has hurt you and you try to take it out on someone like me, but <laughs> hey, what's up, Keeping Faith? How you doing? So um, so anyway, again, I want to repeat, Christianity has nothing to do with people who call themselves Christians. It has everything to do with Christ. And when you are forsaking the assembly, as we see here, they were assembled and they were in one accord and God is about to do something amazing, amazing, a once in a lifetime, a once in a history event where he gives them the Holy Spirit. And it's not going to be that, right? Because that's only a one-time thing. Now the Holy Spirit is here and we have access to it as born-again believers. But um, you do not want to forsake the gathering of the body. Because when you're at church and you're there with the body of Christ, the true body of Christ, they're there to pray for you. They're there to bear your burdens, to encourage you, right? To help in times of need, and that is one of the things that the body is for. And when you don't go to church or I don't need to go to church to be a Christian, okay, you might be right. But you are also hindering something amazing that God wants to do for you and in you and through you. Um, the third thing is, as we see here, is unity. Like I was just talking about. They're, they're all in one accord. And nothing hinders God's blessing in his people more than discord amongst the body. More than bickering and gossip, right? Talking trash. That is the worst. That is probably the worst of all these things that can hinder what God wants to do in the body of Christ. Um, yeah, all right, I'm not sure what's going on in all the comments here. Is there any admins here? Yeah, yeah Sharni, uh, forsaken the, or, or it says to not forsake the assembling of the body. That's Hebrews 10.25. Hebrews 10.25. I think it's somewhere else in the Bible too, but that's the, like the main one that I know. Um, all right, so the fourth thing is obedience. I feel like that's a given, but there's something that we see here, right? And again, these are the four things that I was pointing out that among these disciples that we could learn from and to do well in so that we're not hindering God in our lives. And obedience is the fourth thing. Um, they're not necessarily in any, any given order. You know, like I said, I think unity is probably the most important of those four, but they're all important. But I don't think there's anything more that hinders God than unity, lack of unity. Like imagine they're in this room and then uh, half of them are like, well, I don't want to be in this room. We should go out in the street. And they're like, no, we should stay here. And then they're like, no, well, well let's pray. No, I don't want to pray. I want to do that. Imagine if there was, you know, they weren't in unity. God's like, I'm not coming there. <laughs> you guys better get in line with each other. You guys better be in one accord. All right. So um, obedience, though, was the fourth thing. As we saw in Acts chapter one, they weren't really being obedient. God told them to wait. And here goes Peter and the other disciples trying to pick the 12th disciple. And that, that was not from God. Right. So obedience is key. Jesus also says a few times in the Bible, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. Um, so if you truly love the Lord, you're going to obey his commands, not as a like a militant duty, but as a natural response to what he did for you, because you truly love him. You're going to obey. You obey because you love him. At least that's how it should be. All right. So <laughs> 15 minutes later, we're, we're done with verse one. Let's go to verse two. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Think about that. Uh, Dandy, I'm, I'm based in Las Vegas right now. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house while they were sitting. Just like, think about that. Uh, the people who made The Chosen, there's rumors that they're going to be doing a series on the book of Acts, like after the chosen is done. I can't wait just to see this scene depicted like 
<laughs> it was so crazy, right? But this was a supernatural phenomenon that God did to get everyone's attention. And like I mentioned a little while ago, it's a one-time thing, right? This has never been mentioned in scripture again. It will never happen again like this, okay? This was a one-time phenomenon that happened to get everybody's attention. And to give you like a little, like, you know, whenever I was doing a study on this, I thought of when I was at the World Series of Poker, this was, I don't know, few, four or five years ago, I'll say. And there's like one main, well, there's like several main rooms where everybody plays. This one room that I was in called um, the Pavilion, right? This is where a lot of tournaments right, were going on here. There's like a couple thousand people in this room, right, at any given time. Where I'm in the middle of a tournament and like over each, so there's like hundreds of tables in this room, Okay. Over the tables, they have like this, this, like from the ceiling, there's like a chain that basically comes down and it has like the table number over it. So it, so it's like, it's just hanging in the air is what it is. I remember I'm sitting at the table and I'm kind of just looking up at one point and all of this, the, like the table number signs are just starting to sway. And then you hear people like talking and like starting to say stuff and, I'm, and like it, it took a, se- it took a few seconds to realize like, what is happening? Like, why is everything moving all of a sudden? Right. And there was a little earthquake that happened in Vegas. Um, What's up, crazy guy story? Yeah, absolutely, bro. Uh, I'll send you a DM a little bit later, or you can send me one, and then we can hop on a phone call. Uh, but I remember I'm sitting at this table, and the, everything's moving. And I'm like, and needless to say, that got everyone's attention, okay? And it was a little bit of an earthquake. It wasn't even a big earthquake at all. But I remember it felt crazy. Like, I don't even remember the ground moving, but I remember seeing the signs moving, and I was like, whoa, whoa, <laughs> right? So now imagine... Verse two, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. I can't even fathom that. I'm just thinking about what it was like with this little mini earthquake. Um, So that's just what I thought about. Okay. But again, it was to get everybody's attention because keep in mind in Jerusalem at that time of the year during the Pentecost, which was the most attended event, it would have been jam packed, jam packed because it was the most attended festival. Uh, because it was in the spring and again, like, you know, the best time to travel. So uh, something cool that's, that's also to note here is the word for wind here. It says a rushing mighty wind. The word for wind in the Hebrew, Greek and Latin is the same word used for spirit or excuse me, is the same word that's used for breath, right? So in other words, it's literally the breath of God. Literally, this is, so you could also, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as if, or as of a breath of God, <laughs> and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Really cool. Um, I didn't bother writing it down because it's different in Hebrew than it is in Greek and, and Latin, but it's the same word for breath as it is for wind. In other words, the breath of God. And you can see that also, for example, in Genesis 1 during the creation, where it says the breath of God was blowing over all the waters. In Genesis 2, when he blew his breath into Adam. And also in Ezekiel 37, when God breathed life into the dry bones, which was a prophecy that came true whenever Israel came back together as a nation in 1947. I think it was the 1940s. Um, So just, just really cool. Like I love being able to like look at the original meaning of certain words in certain spots and then realize like, man, I I really should learn Hebrew (laughs) because the Bible just, it hits different in Hebrew. It really does. But maybe one day, I don't know Hebrew. I know a few words. Um, Yes. Amen. That's exactly right. This was God breathing life into the church. Like he breathed life into Adam. That's exactly right. Because like I said, in the beginning of this, Acts chapter two is essentially like the birthday of the church. This is the birth of it all right here where the Holy Spirit came. It's so amazing. Woo! Um, now, some characteristics of the Holy Spirit given that are important to outline in relation to how he moves in the church and on the earth, all right, with great force and not something that, that like, man can create or facilitate, okay? When, like, like, when we read this, just in that verse, this is with great force. This isn't just like, oh, a little breeze came in and it moved the, you know, the curtains a little bit. No, this was... a. Uh, Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of rushing mighty wind, as of the you know, as, as if it's the breath of God coming in. So it came in with great force. And this is not something that man can create or facilitate. It is 100 percent because of God. 100 percent because of God. All right. And I want to reference uh should have. So I'm, so I'm gonna read verse verse three. I should have had this up. There. Because I want to reference another verse whenever I read this. So verse 3. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. Let me uh, 
I should have wrote this down. Sorry about that, guys. All right, so this is John the Baptist, right? In Matthew chapter 3, verses 11, that coincides with, you know, with, with what we just read. Again, there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And in Matthew 3, verse 11, John the Baptist says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry, and he will baptize you with, Holy, with the Holy Spirit and fire. Then appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. <laughs> That's crazy. Okay, so real quick, what does it mean to be baptized with the Holy Spirit? Well, in short, to be empowered to live the life, the set-apart life that we are called to be, a.k.a. holy, that born-again Christians should be living. That's what it is to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. To be empowered, the power of God, to live the set-apart lives that born-again Christians should be living. And in this scene right here, again, keep in mind all the people that are in Jerusalem at this point. There are so many people in, in Jerusalem, and God just did this amazing sign to get everybody's attention. Now, you have the disciples, imagine this, they're standing, like let's say they're on like a balcony right now, and they're standing in front of a mass of people, and they have literal fire over their heads. Think about that. And now when we read what's about to happen after this, it's even more mind-blowing. But just think about that setting, for, a, you know, for example. This mighty rushing wind comes in. Surely most of the people in that area heard it. Maybe the ones really far off didn't hear it. I'm not sure. It doesn't really specify. But definitely the people all in that room, which is roughly about 120 of them, and then all the people that are right outside that building, they heard that. Now there's these people, these disciples, standing there with fire over their heads. <laughs> Literal fire over their heads. Crazy, okay? So, I'm going to get a little deep into this. Um, like, I can't take credit for what I'm about to say. Like, um, I've thought about this before, but I've never associated it with this passage of Scripture. But my pastor just blew my mind when I was doing this study. Okay. So, everyone heard the wind. Okay? That's something that you hear audibly. All right? A.K.A. that's the power associated with the Holy Spirit. Now... As the disciples are standing there with the fire over their heads, now there's a visual. First they heard, they heard, right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God, right? Faith comes by hearing. Now they see it visually. They have fire over their heads. Fire represents purification. How the Holy Spirit purifies us and refines anyone who comes into contact with him. Right? You don't come to Jesus perfect. You don't stop sinning and quit doing all the things you're doing and then come to him. You come to him as you are and you let the power of the Holy Spirit refine you. So when you imagine fire, the Holy Spirit fire, it's a refining, purifying fire. It burns out all that crap that's inside of us. It burns out all these things that we're doing in our life. You come to Jesus and then let the power of the Holy Spirit change you. You don't try to change yourself and then come to Jesus. That'll never work. All right. I don't know who's saying Colt, but we're going to go ahead and mute that person. <laughs> I thought I was going to say something, but I chose not to. Okay. So um, now as we gather that, okay. Now when I read this on the surface, okay, it says, and then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire and one sat upon each of them. All right. Now, when you hear the Holy Spirit, it's the sound of wind, right? And the wind came before the visual. The hearing, the word of God came before the visual. It's very important. Because the word of God always precedes the work of God. Any work that God's going to do, the word of God is going to precede that. Just like we see here. Okay? And unlike many of these new apostolic reformation churches, like Bethel, for example, where they have the school of the supernatural. They put all the emphasis on the works of God. Many times completely independent or contradicting to what the word of God says. I'm going to say that again for the people in the back, okay? We should always have the word of God before the works of God. But people like, or churches like Bethel, I'll do churches, and many other churches that mimic them, they put the focus on the works of God before the word of God. And that is completely backwards, okay? All true works of God are built upon the word of God, not the other way around. I'm going to say that again too. I actually have it in all caps in my notes. The true works of God are built upon the word of God. This is what they're built on. This is the foundation. 
not the other way around, okay? And so many churches and people, like not even necessarily just churches, but people, individuals, I know many of them, and I gently rebuke them and I gently try to open their eyes when they say certain things and it's like, okay, I'm gonna let the Holy Spirit do his job. I'm just gonna plant a seed in that person's life. Now, I'm not saying that these people are not saved. I can't speak on that. But when they're putting the works of God before the word of God, it's a big problem. It's a very, very big problem because in most cases, the foundation of their faith is now based on an emotional experience or something that happened or a feeling that they have. But then what happens when something goes wrong? What, like, what happens when you don't feel God anymore? Backsliding, completely falling away from the faith. I think about Peter, for example. Peter, he literally was with Jesus when Jesus was on this earth for over three years. He saw everything that Jesus did. He performed miracles himself through the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus granted to him when he says, I'm going to send you out two by two. He did these things. He's the one who walked on water. I want to remind you. And whenever Jesus was about to, it was right after the Last Supper, and he says, I'm about to leave you. And Peter's like, Lord, where are you going? Where are you going? I'll die for you. I'll die for you. Where are you going? And Jesus looks at him and says, Peter, you're going to deny me before the sun comes up, before the... And I really said before the rooster crows, but that means before the sun comes up. And Peter's like, no, no, I'm never going to deny you. Now, I truly believe in that moment. Peter didn't think that he would. But then what happens when Jesus is crucified and people start questioning him and say, hey, weren't you with Jesus? Weren't, wasn't that you with him? He's like, no, no. And he did it three times. He denied him. His faith was founded on this emotional experience. This, this, you know, his, his emotions of in that moment, I'm going to die for you, Lord. I'm going to die for you. But then what happens when that faith gets tested? He failed. Even Peter failed. So what do you think is going to happen to people whose faith is founded on these miracle signs and wonders, the supernatural that Bethel focuses on? What do you think is going to happen? They're going to fail. They're going to fall away. They're going to backslide. So much is wrong with that. And it's terrible. And what it's doing to the body of Christ, we're not in unity overall. Why do you think all this crazy stuff is happening in the world and so much evil is out there? We need to be in one accord. We need to be in one accord. All of If you're in any sort of movement like that, if you're a part of anything like that, if you know anybody who's in that, please speak up, okay? We are the body. We need to be able to point these things out to people because, again, the word of God should always precede the works of God, not the other way around, all right? And so many people, like Bethel, for example, they say, oh, if I can see it, then I'll believe it. Right. And this is not just Beth. This is a lot of people in general. If I can see it, I can believe it. But that's not what the Bible says. Scripture says, believe it, then you'll see it. It's John 11, verse 40. You believe it and then you'll see it. Walk by faith, not by sight. Second Corinthians 5, 7. Right. It's about faith. It's not about seeing and then you believe. No, you believe and then you will see. But we have it twisted. And I say we just as human beings, as the body of Christ overall. You see like a church like Bethel that is like a mega church, huge. They're in, like influencing, I'm not going to say impacting, they're influencing so many people the wrong way. And to me, that seems demonic at the core. It seems like Satan is trying to mimic, he's trying to masquerade himself as an angel of light and trying to twist things. Shouldn't be like that, all right? Shouldn't be like that at all. So, um, man, you know, before I started this live, I, I prayed because a lot of these notes are from my pastor and then from my own study that I did, but I wanted to make sure that I put it in my own words. And it's like that right there. I didn't even, it felt like I didn't even know what I was saying because the Holy Spirit was just speaking through me right there. Like that is, oh my goodness. Um, so yeah, verse four. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. All right, so this is the first time that disciples began speaking in languages and dialects that otherwise would have been completely foreign to them. These are Hebrew people, and they're speaking languages, as I'm going to read here in the next few verses in a little bit, um, from people from all over. There's people from all nations that are in Jerusalem at this point. Um, and uh, again, just like God came as a mighty wind, the breath of God and the fire over their heads, he di God did this as a way to get everybody's attention. This is why he did this. There's so many people in Jerusalem at that point, and he's trying to get their attention. And yes, he did get their attention. And this could not be recreated by man. This was only by God. Okay? So 
I want to refer to 1 Corinthians 14, verse 22, which I'm going to refer to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 a lot in this next little bit in regards to speaking in tongues and what verse 4 was just saying. All right, so verse 14, or chapter 14, verse 22, tongues are a sign for those who do not believe, not the ones who do believe. All right, prophesying is for the church. That will edify the church. But tongues is a sign for unbelievers, as we see right here. Okay? It's a sign for unbelievers. 1 Corinthians 14, 40 says, Let all things be done decently and in order. So many church services, and I, feel, I don't even feel right calling them a church, but so many of these circus shows, like a Bethel, they focus on those first five words. Let all things be done. But they just totally like discount the in order part. Like the tunnel of fire, getting drunk in the spirit, slain in the spirit. You got people running around barking like dogs, swinging from chandeliers, like figuratively. You know, like that's not in order at all. The Holy Spirit will never be a facilitator of something that is of disorder. That goes directly against scripture. First Corinthians chapter 14, like I just shared with you. It's got to be in order. Okay. And the churches that do things out of order are drawing attention to them to themselves instead of God. They're putting the focus on them rather than God. And it's taking away from him. And that is not the work of the Holy Spirit. That's a mockery. You know who else likes to mock God? Satan. I'll just leave that there. But again, things like being slain in the spirit, people being drunk, the holy laughter, uh, people running and jumping, that's the exact opposite of how the Holy Spirit operates because it's supposed to be in order and he will never take the focus off God. It's only drawing people to him, pointing people to him, okay? So, and I want you to imagine this. Imagine, let's say there's someone who, in whatever way, they, let's say they get invited to church or they feel like they want to go to church. Um, maybe someone hands them a tract, you know, on the Vegas Strip. Let's say, like, you know what? Maybe I should go to church. I've never been. I keep hearing about Jesus. The world's getting crazy. Well, I'm going to go to church today. Think about that person, okay? That person, imagine someone coming to church for the first time. Church building, right? Because we are the church. The church building, we'll say, okay? And then they see the church, the people, Going crazy, running around barking like dogs, this laughter out of nowhere, rolling around on the ground, getting slain or drunk in the spirit. You know, like, could you imagine a person who comes into a church building and sees that? They're going to, for sure, think that Christians are nuts and I'm never going to step, step foot in that building again. I'm never going to go to get any church again. This is what Christianity is. I don't want any part of that. That's one of the dangers, one of the dangers that could cause people to never come to the Lord because it's not only about Christianity and going to a certain building, it's about Christ. So people who hear about Jesus who get invited to a church and they walk in and they see the circus show, what is that going to do? It's surely not going to lead them to the Lord. It's going to scare them away and it could potentially scare them away for all of eternity. Now they're burning in a lake of fire for all of eternity for their sins because they did not have a savior because of the circus show that some of these churches put on. This mockery, this, this, this show. You see how dangerous that is? And that is happening often. Now, with that said, there's another end of the spectrum. There's people who are known as cessationists, right? These people think that all the gifts of the Holy Spirit died with the original apostles in the, in, in the first century, okay? Now, there's, like, I'm not saying that they're not saved, okay? They might be going to heaven, um, but they're the... <laughs> My, like my pastor used the, the uh, phrase, he said, it's like they're the frozen chosen is what he said. <laughs> I really like that. So I'm not saying that they're not saved, but there's another end of the spectrum where you walk into a church service and you're like, is this church or is this a funeral? Like this just feels so dead and just like there's no energy in here at all. So there is another end of the spectrum. So it's important to have that balance. And that's one of the reasons, one of the reasons why I love Calvary Chapel. There is that balance. Not only do they teach straight from the word verse by verse, expository teaching, but there's a balance. It's always in order. You won't see no crazy sideshow acts like you're walking into a circus at a Calvary Chapel. At least like maybe there's, you know, maybe there, there are some out there that are different, but every Calvary Chapel that I've been to, and I've been to many, um, they are in order. They preach straight from the word verse by verse, and it's led by the Holy Spirit. So um, again, we should let all things be done 
for sure. All things be done, but decently and in order. So in other words, do both, but make sure they are led by the Holy Spirit. Yep, I go to Calvary Chapel. That is where I go. Uh, I, I just moved to Vegas from, well, I didn't just move. I guess it's been like five months now from Charleston, South Carolina. My pastor in Charleston, Pastor Vic Carroll, he's originally from Vegas. He was mentored by Pastor John Knapp at the Calvary Chapel Green Valley that I go to out here. And long story short, the Lord called him to Charleston where he didn't know anybody, never even been before. And he started Calvary Chapel Somerville, which is my home church. And now look at how the Lord works. It's like full circle where now God sent me out to Vegas. And now I'm going to the church that my pastor came from. <laughs> it's so awesome. It's so awesome. Um, for anybody who's just coming in, if you missed the first part of this, uh, again, all these Bible studies are going to be on my YouTube channel. Um, Acts chapter one that I did last week is already up there. And this one I'll be posting like within the next day or two. Um, so they're all going to be on the YouTube channel. So if you missed it, don't worry, you can catch it on YouTube. Um, so, all right, let's continue. Now, now I'm going to read verses uh, five through 11. All right. And then I'll say some things. So, okay, now this is titled The Crowd's Response. And there were dwelling, or excuse me, and there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. There were many different type of people there, okay? And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together, referring to the rushing wind, the breath of God. So, so this verse right here actually tells us that many people heard it. Maybe people from even way down the street heard this, okay? When this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language, tongues. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, look, are not all these who speak Galileans? They're like, wait, these are Hebrew guys. How are they speaking my Ethiopian language? How are they speaking blah, 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 like, like whatever the language is? How are they speaking this, right? These are Hebrew guys from Galilee. Verse eight, and how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born. I'm probably going to butcher some of these, these nation names, but Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, <laughs> Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome and both Jews and proselytes. Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. Okay, I'm going to underline that part. So it just named like, so, so this is the crowd's response. They're like, wait a second. How are we hearing our own native tongue from people who are foreign to this? They would have no idea what our language even sounds like. They've never been to our country. How do they even know what it sounds like? But they're speaking our native tongue. Aren't these guys from Galilee? How are they speak in my language from Parthia or from Elamite or from Judea or from Pontus or Figria? Like all these nations that I, I don't even know how to really say them. There's some crazy names there. Um, so that's the setting, right? Now, verse 11, when it says, and we hear them speaking in our own tongues, our own languages, the wonderful works of God. Okay. So not only are they baffled and they're confused at this point, but they're like, wait a second. They're speaking the wonderful works of God. Now it's, it's not them, it's not the disciples with the fire over their heads speaking to the people in the crowd, okay? They weren't talking to them. These men who they were marveling at were speaking to God. They were praising God. That's what tongues is. It's essentially our language to God. It's us praising God. We're not speaking to another individual in tongues. I've seen videos over the last couple of years for example, uh, Kenneth Copeland and this other guy, Rodney, Br Rodney Howard Brown, one of the most blasphemous videos I've ever seen in my life. And this was before I, this was like a couple months into me surrender my life to the Lord. I didn't know nearly what I know now. These two dudes are speaking in tongues to each other. One speaking, I'm not even going to mimic it or mock it. I'm not even, like, not even going to do it, but one is speaking in tongues to him. He's speaking in tongues back. And then they're like laughing as if they're having a conversation in tongues that goes directly against scripture. That is pure evil and blasphemous. That's not what tongues is, okay? So these people were praising God out loud, which is a key component to understanding the purpose and the function of tongues in the church, okay? It, it's instrumental, it says it right there. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. It didn't say we hear them speaking to us and telling us the gospel. We didn't, it doesn't say we hear them speaking to us telling us we need to repent of our sins. No, these people who they're marveling at in their own language are worshiping the Lord, okay? 
And if you want to um, like reference 1 Corinthians 14, again, I told you I was going to be in 1 Corinthians 14 a lot. Um, uh, invested in you, you are completely wrong. They were talking to each other in that video and then they were laughing. It was, I'm not going to argue with you. I know what I saw. I watched it. It blew my mind. And it was also during my first three day um, water fast where my focus of that fast was false teachers because my whole life, basically, I was listening to people like a Stephen Furtick or a Joyce Meyer or a T.D. Jakes, um, Joel Osteen. I didn't necessarily like listen to Joel Osteen a lot, but I did at times. And my study on this whenever I was doing a fast was Lord show me and reveal to me these false teachers. And it was three days of spending time in the word first and foremost, and then watching different videos of different sermons of these people who are just making a mockery of the Lord. First Corinthians 14 two. for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Let me say that again. It just kind of culminates everything that I just said. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Just like these people with fire over their heads that everybody else is marveling at. They were not talking to them. They were talking to God. Okay. God doesn't speak to man in tongues, right? Or give special revelation or prophecy in tongues. Tongues is our praise language to God. If you're ever at a church service and the pastor just all of a sudden starts blurting out in tongues, right? To you, like he's speaking to you. And then he says, the Lord just told me that we're going to meet our building goal by June 1st and we're going to get the money that we need. No, he did not. No, he did not. Tongues are us to the Lord. It's not the Lord speaking to us or us speaking to a congregation. Prophecy is for believers. Tongues is for unbelievers. And whenever you're speaking in tongues, we're praising the Lord. I'll say it one more time. 1 Corinthians 14, 2, for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, period. Verse 12 and 13. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what could this mean? Others mockingly said, they are full of new wine. Although it's beyond explanation of what's happening right now to everybody who was in attendance there, and although it's so obvious that it's from God, when you have people from all nations hearing these guys who have no idea what their language is speaking in their language, the amer like, like the amazing things about God, when they have literal fire over their heads, something unexplainable is happening right now. It 1000% has to be God. There will always be mockers and people who refuse to believe. There will always be mockers and people refusing to believe. Uh, a God is government. If you're referring to, for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, that's 1 Corinthians 14, 2. But I just want to say right here, as it says, so others mockingly said they are full of new wine. And like, in other words, they're drunk. Just like these days, guys, you can see such an amazing move of God in so many different ways. And people will always not everybody, obviously, but there will be, because like right here, it doesn't say everybody in the crowd. It just says others were mockingly saying they're full of new wine. They're drunk. Okay. And unfortunately, that's the case. That's going to happen with some people. Doesn't matter how many signs that you give them. They're always going to want another sign, but they're still not going to believe. And those, a lot of those people, again, like we were talking about earlier, they're putting the works of God before the word of God. The word of God should always come first. Faith comes by hearing hearing the word of God. Okay. So although this is beyond explanation, there always, are, you know, there, there, there's always going to be mockers always. And, you know, I'm putting myself in this situation. If I was these people who they're referring to who were mocking, I would think I'd be asking myself like, am I drunk? Did someone just like roofie me or something? Like, like thinking of like in a modern sense, like wh what did I just eat? Did someone poison me? Like, am I hallucinating right now? Am I drunk? I don't think I would ever ask, are they drunk? They have fire over their heads speaking in my language. And they're from a completely different area of the world. I would ask myself if I'm drunk, <laughs> for, like, to be real. Um, and in closing, all right, of Acts chapter 13, or Acts chapter 1, verses 13. This is very sad to say this, but it's just, it's just the reality that humans in general are more dismissing of amazing proofs of God and these things that they see. They're much more dismissing of it. Um, if what 
is being proven reveals the depravity of their sins and their need of a savior than just accepting it. They would rather just be like, nah, those guys are drunk. And like in verse 14, as I'll pick up within the next one, Peter's like, they're not drunk. It's the third hour. It's nine in the morning. They're not drunk. This is real. This is straight from God. But you're choosing not to believe. You're choosing to just make an excuse because just like us these days, human beings in general, anything that is of God, they'd rather just dismiss it and say, no, that's not of God and make an excuse. Nah, uh, the world was just, uh, you know, the world just appeared out of accident over billions and billions of years. We've just evolved from like uh, space dust. You know, we came from, from apes or whatever. People will make up this crazy stuff instead of just accepting that God is real. His word is true. We all need a savior and Jesus is coming back. They're like, nah, nope. They're just drunk. And I don't say that like happily. That's so sad, but it is the reality of human beings. Like, like not all of us, obviously. Um, but what's the word said? The word tells us that broad is the road to destruction and many will find it. But narrow is the path to everlasting life and very few will find it. Let's be that light in the world. All right. Don't let it um, get you down. Don't let it sadden you. Don't let it just be like, well, what's the point? They're just going to mock me. I'm just going to sit on my hands and I'm just going to wait for Jesus to come back. No, there's people out there who are dying, who are lost every single day. And this passage doesn't say that everybody was mocking. It says that they were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Shortly before, they were, they were saying how they knew that they were speaking to God. These were the amazing things of God. But there's always going to be mockers. There's always going to be haters. But don't let the haters deter you. There's going to be haters everywhere that you go. And there's going to come a time, like I live in America, and it's, the persecution isn't really that bad yet, but it's getting worse. There's other places like China where you get arrested if you have a Bible and they can't even have a Bible on them. So instead they just read it and memorize it. They, they walk six miles to and from to go to a church service underground. They have to hide because the persecution is so bad. And some Arab countries in like, um, in like the Middle East, they literally are hunted and persecuted and killed for believing in Jesus. It's bad in a lot of areas, not in America yet, but there will come a time where it is. And so there's always going to be haters, but don't let that deter you from sharing the gospel, from sharing your testimony, from being the hands and feet of Jesus, for being bold, being bold in your faith. Don't be like bold as a lion, not a feline, not, not like a little kitty going around. Oh, I'm just going to say God bless you to people and, uh, you know, tell them Jesus loves you. Okay, that's not bad, right? You could say much worse things to people, but is that helping anybody? You just saying, God bless you. People that live in the world say, God bless you, just because it's like a nice gesture, right? What is that really doing? Be bold in your faith, okay? Don't let the haters, don't let the mockers saying that you're drunk, don't let them affect you. We are all called to be ambassadors of Christ. And the way that I imagine myself is like a walking mirror. Everywhere that I go, I imagine myself as a walking mirror reflecting the light and the love of Christ out and anytime someone tries to give me praise or glory, I reflect it right back up to him. That's how I literally imagine myself when I'm out in the streets. Like yesterday, I'll share this testimony. After church, there was a group of us that were going to go out to eat. And, um, and like I went live yesterday. If you guys heard this while I was live, but I, I, I shared what happened. Um, we went out to eat and then we were going to go see his only son. It's a movie done by the people who created The Chosen all about Abraham. It was incredible. I went actually back to see it late last night, which, you know, I'll get to in a second. So when we go to the movie, it was like a four, four o'clock movie. I bought the ticket through this like link. Uh, it's called Adam tickets or something. And someone in the group chat sent it and I bought my ticket. I never got the email for the ticket that has like the actual e you know email confirmation. I never got it for some reason. The money came out of my Apple pay account. I know exactly what seat I bought. The seat was bought in, uh, you know, according to the website. I had every other proof that I bought it except for the actual ticket. You know, the, the email never came in. I don't know what happened. So I get to the movie theaters and I'm like, all right, I'm just going to show them my Apple Pay. I have a transaction ID number. I'll give them my email. I'll be good to go. I get there. Long story short, the manager wouldn't let me in. He says, uh, I believe you and I see that the seat has been bought, but I can't verify that that's you. And I'm like, well, you don't really believe me then because look, I have the transaction ID. Like it, like the money came out of my account. He's like, sir, I'm sorry. There's nothing I can do. I can't let you in. You can buy another ticket if you want. And I'm like, I'm not going to buy another ticket, man. I already bought the ticket. And at this point, 
like for a second, it was almost like a prideful thing for, for just a second, because I was like, no, like out of principle, I'm not going to buy another ticket. Like, like this is what I'm thinking on the inside. And then when I turned to the group and I told them kind of what happened, there was a quickening in, in, in my spirit where the Holy Spirit was clearly saying to me, he didn't want me in the theater at that time. There was a task for me to do. So someone in the group was like, Corey, I can buy it for you, you know, because they know my financial situation. I don't really have, I have no money coming in right now. I don't know how I'm going to pay bills. Like I don't have a job. I'm just trusting the Lord. Right. So they were like, well, I'll buy it for you. I'm like, no, it's fine. You know what? I think this is very clear that the Lord has shut this door because he doesn't want me going into the movie theater today. I said, I'm going to go out there and evangelize for a couple hours where you guys are in the movie. Enjoy, you know, just text me whenever you get out. Cause, cause I rode with someone from the church. I didn't have my car with me or anything. So that's what I, and like, most of them were like, what do you mean? No, like, like, let me just buy you a ticket. I'm like, no, the Lord is telling me to go out there. So I'm going to go out there. So that's what I did. Right. I imagine myself as a walking mirror. I'm out there and it's a gorgeous day out yesterday. It's cold today, but it's gorgeous yesterday. So I'm imagining I'm just reflecting the light and the love of Christ out. I was walking up and down the streets. Now this area is called town square. There's a bunch of stores and restaurants and kids running around everywhere, like at this playground. So I'm just like passing by people, like giving compliments, just like, oh, I love your shoes. Like, oh, he's adorable. Like just, just being like, just showing the love of Jesus is what I'm doing. And the whole time I'm like praying, I'm like, all right, Lord, who am I supposed to talk to? What do you have for me to do today? I know there's a reason why I didn't go to the theater. So somebody from the group then messaged me and said, Corey, I have Bibles in my car if you want to go to the car. And they actually have a Tesla so they can like open the car from their phone. So I'm like, all right, word, I'll go to your car. So I go to the car to get the Bibles out. My phone was close to being dead and I wanted to make sure that my phone didn't die so they can get a hold of me whenever they got out of the theater. So I sat in the back seat. They have like a little um, little plug-in or whatever in the back seat. Uh, and I started charging my phone just to, you know, just to get some juice. So instead of just sitting there while my phone's charging, I'm like, let me go live on TikTok. All right? So I go live on TikTok. Several things happened during this live, but I shared the testimony of what I just said to you. One woman came in. Um, her name was B. Wright, I remember, in the chat. And she says, I don't want to be alive. She wanted to kill herself. It was powerful. I don't even remember exactly what came out of my mouth. It was all the Holy Spirit, but I spoke right to her through the screen. Then we all prayed. We all prayed for her. And I don't remember actually seeing another message from her in the chat. Like there was a lot of messages. There was like a hundred something people in the live. But I remember she came in and the Holy Spirit just took control of my tongue and I was just speaking right to her. And then we all prayed for her right there. Somebody else came in and said that she's been really, really nervous and worried because she doesn't have a job right now and she's in a new city and I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Again, spoke directly to her, share with her Matthew 6.33, which has been one of my life verses. Seek first the kingdom and all his righteousness and all things will be added unto you. That's what I'm doing. I have no income coming in. I don't know how I'm supposed to pay bills and stuff, but I'm seeking him first, doing what he leads and all things will be added. Rent money, bill money, car payment, food, everything will be added. And I'm just pouring into her and she says... Thank you. Like all capital letters. I remember she's like, thank you so much. I can't believe I found you live. I didn't even, or, or like she wasn't even following me. Somehow she saw my live pop up and she tuned in and she felt so much better. And then I share with her Matthew six. I share with her a few verses. She felt so much better. Several other things, not as drastic as someone who wanted to kill themselves, but so many things happened in that hour that I was live. So then I ended the live and I was like, all right, guys, there's something I know that I got to go do out here. And I had these Bibles and I had some tracks and I was going to go out and just evangelize. Right. So I did. And uh, I went out and I talked to a few people. But the main one, the main person I spoke to was this woman. She was about to cross the road. And I was like, hey, what's up? How are you? And I remember she you know, like I kind of scared her a little bit because I'm I mean, I walk fast and I'm also like like I'm six five. So I'm tall. My hair is a little crazy right now. But usually I got like poofy hair. I'm tall. I'm always like walking fast and I'm like very energetic. So she was like, oh, I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to scare you. I was like, hey, would you like a Bible? And she's like, oh, I have a few of those already. And I was like, oh, okay, well, maybe this is a sign from the Lord for you to open it. I just said it just like very, I didn't say it in a mean way. I said it in, in love and I'm saying it with like a smile on my face. And she's like, huh, she says, you know, maybe you're right. And I was like, well, um, is there anything I can pray for you about? Right. And she says, well, and she's like, actually, and then she opens up and she says how some stuff's going on in her job right now. She don't know if she's going to lose her job. Her marriage is falling apart. She doesn't know if her husband's cheating on her. He's been hiding this like $60,000 debt that she has. Like she just like literally the floodgates just open up uh, and she starts uh, just opening up to me for about 30 minutes easily, 30 or 40 minutes. I'm talking to this woman and there was so much that was said but I was just pouring into her. I was sharing scripture with her. I shared Matthew 6.33 with her as well. And I remember after I shared Matthew 6.33, I said, um, 
or she said, she's like, so you're basically telling me that I just need to focus on Jesus and, and my relationship with him and then everything else will get better. And I said, well, yeah, basically that's what I'm saying, right? And she says, you know, that's kind of crazy that you just said that because a few weeks ago, my cousin, who's a pastor, said the exact same thing to her. And I was like, oh, really? And I was like, look how God just sends this this uh, tall dude with poofy hair to come over and confirm that. And she was like, wow. And she was like, you know, because it's been a few weeks and I just haven't really thought of it. And, you know, the word also tells us that no prophet goes without honor except in his own hometown. Or in other words, you can say she didn't believe her cousin because, oh, that's just my cousin preaching at me. You know, she doesn't really listen to him. So God sends someone else who is not close to her, who is not a prophet, right? Like, you know, in his own hometown. And she heard me loud and clear. And then the Holy Spirit brought back to her remembrance. Wow, my cousin told me that weeks ago, right? And um, and then I, I say a lot to her. We're, we're going back and forth talking. And then at shortly, or like, like however long later, part of the group that I was with, they found me. Like, like they were walking down that street and they were just waiting over to the side. And I, I didn't even see, I don't even know how long they were there actually. And then I saw them. And then um, and then I, and like I rode with, with that group of people. And um, I was like, oh, sorry guys. I was like, okay, we're almost done. And I was like, all right. And this lady's name's Amanda. And I was like, Amanda, can I pray for you? And she was like, yes, please. So I said, Maximina Salem. And like, I called them over and we all got together and prayed over Amanda. And um, <laughs> it was awesome. Uh, and then, so at first she didn't take a Bible because she said she had a few. Then the conversation happened. And then um, I asked her what church that she goes to. And she says that she goes to this church called Central. Now this, this church Central, I used to go to Central. Whenever I was here for poker, since 2013, 2019, I was in Vegas. Or 2000, yeah, yeah, 2019. I was in Vegas for seven weeks every summer. That's the church that I went to, right? It used to be called Central Christian. But they dropped the name Christian because they didn't want to offend anybody. It's the epitome of a prosperity gospel church. The epitome. I didn't know it at the time, like, because before I fully surrendered my life to the Lord, I was a Christian, but I was lukewarm at best. And I didn't know that I was going to these prosperity gospel churches. So when I, when she said uh, central, I'm like, okay. And I, I said it in grace, but I, I just said to her exactly what I just said to you. And I even said some of the quotes that like one of the pastors says, it's okay to not be okay, right? Which is okay. Like, it sounds good. It's very motivational. But I was like, I guarantee you've never heard about repentance or denial of self. And she's like, no, actually. I was like, every message is basically like just a feel good motivational speech, isn't it? She's like, yeah. She's like, you know, I've been going there for like 20 years, but I haven't been the last few years because of that exact reason. It felt like it was just like this motivational speech and she wasn't growing. She wasn't learning at all, but that's her home church that she goes to. So then I said, hey, look, okay. And I remember I was like, um, can I get your number? I want to text you my number. And I was like, actually, no, it's weird because it's a woman. You know, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to write my number down. So I put it on the back of a track and then I put the track that I had. It says, do good people get to heaven? Um, and she was like, well, I hope I'm good enough. And I said, Amanda, pro tip, none of us are good enough. No one is good enough to earn their salvation. And she was like, what do you mean? And then kind of the conversation started again, but everybody's waiting for me. So I just did like a short version of that. Um, and then I said, okay, look, I'm going to write down my number. I put it on the track and I put it in Matthew chapter six. And I said, read Matthew chapter six when you get home. She says, okay, I will. And I said, if you ever want to talk, if you ever want to come to church, you're more than welcome. My number's on that track. And she says, thank you so much. I said, can I give you a hug? And she says, yeah. And then I, I go give her a big hug. And um, she had tears in her eyes. I had tears in my eyes. It was beautiful. And I say all that, I, I know I kind of said the long version of the story, but everywhere I go, I try to be a walking mirror, reflecting the light and the love of Jesus out. And I knew that there was a reason why I wasn't supposed to go into that movie theater. I knew it. I didn't know exactly what was going to happen, but I knew it because I was being obedient to what the Holy Spirit was laying on my heart. In my flesh, in Corey's mind, I'm like, wait, I already got the ticket. The whole church family's going there. It's going to be an amazing movie. I want to go see it. But the flesh is weak, right? In that moment, like, I wanted to go to the movies, but the Spirit is willing. And the Spirit was like, nope, nope. So I went out and evangelized for a couple hours, had that amazing TikTok live. I don't know for sure, but I might have saved, well, it wasn't me. It was the Holy Spirit through me saving someone's life who was suicidal. And then Amanda, which hopefully I'll see her again one day. Um, but uh, yeah, so with all that said, don't let other people who mock or who say, oh, they're just drunk. Don't let them affect you, okay? Don't let it phase you. There's people dying out there every single day. And we have, we should not be living in a spirit of fear, we operate through the power of the Holy Spirit who empowers us to go out there and do these things. Corey did not do what I just said to you yesterday. That was 100% the Holy Spirit. That was not me at all. So, um, yeah.
I didn't really plan on telling that story that I just said, but it just coincided with this perfectly. Um, and uh, that's just the first 13 verses of Acts chapter 2. We're going to do the rest over the next week or two. Um, but uh, yeah, <laughs> thank you, Jesus.